Well, good morning. You know, we began this series on February 3rd of 2019, and we're finally coming to a close this morning. I knew as I began this message that there would be a certain level of bittersweetness in those words as they came out of my mouth, and I was right about that. It's definitely there. I'm looking back at this being the first book of the Bible that I ever preached through in its entirety with my church family. I'm thinking that this is going to be the last time for quite a while anyway that I'm going to be asking any of you to open up to the Gospel of John. And there's a real danger that I'm going to get overly sentimental. So to avoid all of that, I am just going to ask you to go ahead and open with me to John 21. Uh, if you want a shortcut to get there, just flip to the book of Acts, turn one page back, and you're going to be right where you need to be. We are going to be considering all of the parting words of the beloved disciple in his account of the life of the Lord Jesus. And we've been looking at this together for the last 15 months or so. I think if we wanted to, we could probably divide up this last chapter and spread it out over a couple of weeks. But I think we'd lose some momentum. And I also think that this is a faithful approach to John's intent, taking it all at once. And so that's what we're going to do. And as we do that, I want to bring up three applications. The first is a reflection on all of us. The second is a reflection on our hearts to those around us. And the third is a reflection on the one above us. We're going to go in that order. As you turn there, if you're able to do so, I want to ask that you stand in reverence to what God has spoken. This is the word of God. These are the words of God given to the Apostle John by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we ought to receive them as such. So hear now the words of the living and the true God. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about one hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? And knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifest to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? 
This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we stand for the final time, at least in this season and in this series, before the words of this gospel. And we're thankful for every verse. God, as I think back to the many Sundays that we've gathered around what's written here and the five or so that we've gathered around so differently as of late, I'm reminded of your faithfulness and your grace. And Lord, that's what we're seeing so predominantly in this final chapter. And so I pray that you would anchor our hearts right here. May we be reminded in our time together of the relentless pursuit of Jesus and the depth of his love for us. Grant me faithfulness, Father, in preaching. And grant the church of flushing faithfulness in hearing and in doing for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week at our drive-in service, and I really love that, by the way. I hope that you did too, and I hope that we can actually do that again sometime. Uh, we ended our scripture reading with these words from the end of chapter 20. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. And if you're hearing that, you might be thinking like me, well, that would have made an excellent conclusion to John's gospel. It sounds like he's finished. You read that and it, it kind of sounds like an epilogue. I mean, Jesus has risen. He's conquered death. He's been reunited with his disciples. We have one more affirmation of his divine identity coming from Thomas in his words, my Lord and my God. And, and even we, all of us, we get a shout out kind of from Jesus as he sort of breaks the fourth wall. I, I can almost picture him looking out and saying, blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. And so we have all of these elements, and then we have these last two verses that remind us of John's purpose in this book and the theme of it all, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's why John's written this. And then in believing what he's written, we might have life and the Jesus he's written about. But just when you think he should be done, you look at the next page and there's like 25 more verses. Some of you are hearing that and you're thinking that sounds a lot like one of my sermons, but you're not allowed to think that today because you can actually eat breakfast while you watch this. In fact, I would actually encourage you to do that because that's what we find the disciples doing in this text. They're eating breakfast with one another and with the Lord. And so that might actually bring you right into the story. So I'd actually encourage you to do that. But why did the Holy Spirit inspire John to continue beyond chapter 20? Remember, this is the word of God given to John by the Spirit. Now, John wrote it. It's got his personality like every other book in this Bible. There's a unique style to it. He didn't just receive it out of heaven. He didn't go into some trance when he wrote it. But at the same time, all that John wrote first came from the breath of God. He superintended it, and he delivered it to us as a perfect message through an imperfect messenger. But why chapter 21? Well, I want to give you at least one reason. This probably isn't the only one, but it's at least one reason. And then I want to draw an application out of that this morning. If you're a note taker, write this down. When it comes to those he loves, God will write another chapter. When it comes to those he loves, God will write another chapter. And I believe this chapter is being written for Peter, but the application of it is really for all of us. And here's why I think it's so important that we have a chapter 21. In Matthew 10, Jesus says these words, Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Well, the problem is, if you turn back just a couple of pages, you're going to find that Peter denied Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times, with swearing, and that's after all this grandstanding that he did in the upper room where he said that he was ready to die, and when he said that even if everyone else fell away, he wouldn't. 
Now, if you take the testimony of the other Gospels and you take the testimony of the, the New Testament as a whole, you'll actually find a couple of allusions to the fact that Jesus met with Peter privately after his resurrection. Luke 24, 34 and 1 Corinthians 15, 5 both tell us that he appeared uniquely to Peter. He came to him. But beyond the record that there was a reunion, we really don't have any information about that reunion. We don't have any of the content. We don't know what was said. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said that a man's repentance needs to be as notorious as his sin. And when it comes to Peter's sin, when it comes to his denial, it's about as notorious as you can get. It's recorded for us in all four of the Gospels. And to really drive that home for you, you think about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're all pretty similar. They're, they're not exact. They're different in perspective. They, they have some differences in terms of their narratives, but they parallel each other a whole lot. Meanwhile, about 90% of John's Gospel is unique, is exclusive to John's Gospel. You've got Jesus's I am statements. You've got his prayer in chapter 17 that we spent about three weeks on. You've got uh, the upper room discourse. You've got several of the miracles we've read about. You have some of those other stories. There's not a lot of overlap actually with John and the other gospels. And yet Peter's lapse of conviction is still here. And so we've got a threefold denial given to us in four places. So Jesus is coming to him, and he's not coming to him privately and individually this time, but he's coming to him publicly. And this is a good 80 miles from where we were last week. It was Jerusalem where they found the empty tomb. It was Jerusalem where Jesus appeared to them behind closed doors, but they're back in Galilee now. The Sea of Tiberias in verse 1 is the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias was a Roman emperor, and they named a city nearby after him, so sometimes the lake itself was called Tiberias. But this is 80 miles away from where we were. Something to think about this morning. Just how far has Jesus gone to get you? No matter how far he's gone in the days of your life, that's after having already gone from heaven to earth and from earth to the cross and from the cross to the grave and back again. You have been pursued, Christian. Something you need to realize and I want you to realize this morning is that you have been pursued by the God who breathed out light and wound up the watch of time. The God who fashioned all of the mountains, the God who filled the seas and made the sun to burn, the very God who actually keeps that sun from burning out. He's pursued you. But as wonderful as all those things are, that only takes a word from his mouth. He spoke and it was made, the scriptures tell us. And he sustains it all, he upholds it all by the word of his power. That's the same action, but he didn't speak your salvation. That's not what he did. He took on flesh and he died for your salvation. That's love. That's love. You, your salvation, in a sense, is a greater miracle than the creation of this universe. And God's pursuit of you began when you were the farthest from him. He died for you while you were yet a sinner, Romans says. And here we see that even when we stray, even when we stumble, even when it seems like we're sliding down the mountain upon which the cross has made us to stand, Jesus pursues us still. He still comes after us. He still comes to us. You know, I really believe in our thinking that we tend to default to our pursuit of God and the love that we have for Him. We have all these expressions in the Scriptures that we're to follow hard after Him and seek after Him diligently and devote our hearts to Him. And all of these things are right. He's worthy of all of them, every last one of them. But they're all reactionary. They're all reactionary. Our love our pursuits. These things are empowered responses to the radical love of God in Christ, throwing himself into the shame, bleeding on a tree, dying as a curse. And after all of that, if that weren't enough, then coming to us on a beach to call us out of our struggles and to call us to breakfast and to restore us. Where do some of us end up without another chapter? Where does Peter end up? without another chapter. If you know the full story, Jesus had instructed his disciples to meet him in Galilee. You can actually go to Matthew 28 and you'll get a better understanding of all that, but that's not why they're fishing. 
That's Peter's idea in verse 3. And it might have been to keep busy. It might have been to pay his bills. Could have just been because he missed it. And I've heard a lot of speculation about it. Some even calling it disobedience and a demonstration that Peter had abandoned his calling in a sense and returned to his old life. But I, I don't really think that that's clear from the text. And I actually personally have a hard time believing that, that right after seeing the resurrected Christ, that's the moment when Peter would decide to become a full-time fisherman again. I, I just, I don't know if I buy that that Peter was hanging it up and running away. I don't think that's clear from what we read. But what is clear is that they had a pretty lousy night. Now, I'm not a fisherman. Anyone who's heard me speak at the Wild Game Dinner, like last February, knows that pretty infamously. But I've heard from those who really like it that the reason it's called fishing and not catching is because the real enjoyment comes from just getting away and, and being in the water. And that empty buckets don't necessarily mean that it was an empty day or an empty night if you want to make the application to this text except that going along with their familiar trade and they're using the nets they're probably catching these to go and sell them in the market so they're probably at least a little more disappointed than the folks who kind of leave their rods leaning up against the side of the boat and not off for a net and then this guy shows up on the beach Verse 4 tells us that they have no idea that this is Jesus. We see a few verses later that they're about uh, 100 yards away from the land or so. so about a football field away. And he calls to them and he asks if they've caught anything. And they say no. And so he tells them, well, we'll throw your net over the right-hand side of the boat. And, and then you'll catch something. That's going to fix your problem. Now to really picture this, you need to know something, I think, of the spatial dimensions of this boat. The distance between the right side of the boat and the left side of the boat is about seven and a half feet. That's it. Seven and a half feet. So Jesus is saying, take your net from right here and put it right over there. And that's going to solve all your problems. Some of you have come to me before and you've said, Preacher, I want to take you fishing. And I kind of wonder, as I was preparing this sermon, I kind of wondered, if I had gone with you, and, and you weren't having any luck, and I looked at just the other side of our boat and said, maybe try over there. I think you'll have better luck over there. You'd probably be ready to throw me overboard. But what do they got to lose, these disciples? If they catch even one fish, well, they're already way ahead of where they were. That's a real improvement. Maybe he's seeing something that they can't see from their vantage point, so they go ahead and do it. And when they do it, verse 6 tells us that they couldn't pull the net back in. There's probably an illustration in that about the fruitfulness of obedience. Uh, maybe about being uh, unafraid to change the way you've been doing something as long as it's the Lord that's directing it. I, I don't know. I'm just going to plant those seeds and walk away because I'm watering something else today, but just something else to chew on. The ridiculousness of what has just happened isn't lost on them. They moved their nets seven and a half feet and went from having no fish to having more fish than they can pull into the boat. And it's in that moment that they realize they've just received a fishing lesson from the one who created fish. Just like the morning of the resurrection, John's the first one to see it and believe it, and Peter's the first one to act. John tells him it's the Lord, and as soon as he hears that, verse 7 says he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work. Peter's in his underwear. How much does Jesus love you, by the way, that he comes to you in that condition? I wonder if some of you in quarantine are meeting him that way today, and I'm not judging you. I just want you to break that habit before we start meeting together again, or I'm going to keep this whole social distancing thing going for quite a while. It's kind of a strange detail, though, Peter putting this robe on before he jumps out. Most of the time, if someone's jumping out of a boat or entering into the water, they're stripping down, they're, they're taking something off, but Peter's putting something on. And I can't help but wonder if maybe this isn't somehow guilt working its way out into his actions. You think back to the, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, and you find them hiding from God. They tried to cover themselves in their nakedness. I kind of think of that story, and I wonder if that's what Peter's doing here, maybe subconsciously, because it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense otherwise. I mean, here's Peter. He denied the Lord. He disowned the Lord. And before he dives into the water, he covers himself. Just a thought. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. I don't know. He puts this robe on. And he's overboard, right into the water. This is characteristically Peter. Everything about this is Peter. He's not always heading in the right direction, but he is always getting there fast. Amen? This is Peter. 
The other disciples follow in the boat because they weren't that far away, John tells us, and they're dragging the net. They're dragging all of those fish onto the land. They're doing all the hard work. But we get down to verse 11, and we find that, that Peter makes up for that, and he drags it the rest of the way himself. 153 fish. People have been trying to read meaning out of that number for a couple thousand years. And if you want to read up on some theories, you could probably fill up your afternoon with them. But I think it might be as simple as that was Jesus filling up the net. You remember the beginning of this gospel. His first miracle was a miracle of abundance. And I think he's ending his earthly ministry with another miracle of abundance. He's just trying to get their attention. Now, we don't get this story from John's gospel, but the contrast it gives us and the transformation inside of Peter that it shows us is just so amazing that I want to draw your attention to it. Jesus actually did something very similar to this back in Luke chapter 5 when he first called them. Uh, on that same lake, by the way, when he first called them to follow him and to be his disciples. We're told that they worked hard all night, that they caught nothing. And Jesus comes along and he tells them to put their nets down one more time. And they do it and they catch so many fish that their nets begin to break and the boat starts taking on water. In fact, they have another boat nearby and they start putting some of the fish in it and it starts to sink a little bit too. And when Peter realized what Jesus had just done for them, he says, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. He took his eyes off of Jesus and he put them on himself. On another occasion, Jesus came to him also on that same lake, walking on the waves. And for just one moment, when the Lord called him, Peter got out of the boat and he's walking on those same waves. But he saw the storm and he felt the wind. And all of a sudden he started to sink because he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked at his circumstances. But now Peter wants to run toward Jesus. Peter wants to swim toward Jesus. He, his eyes are off himself. His eyes are off his circumstances. And he is right where he needs to be, even though he has so much more to be ashamed of now. And I think this actually shows a transformation in Peter. It's not finished. He's not finished. We're going to see that. But he's most certainly at this point a practicing Christian. And at the end of the day, that's all any of us are, really. Until the Lord calls us home. We're all practicing Christians constantly improving, sometimes falling into a rut, getting back up, waiting for glorification. We're never perfected until that time, but we progress, we move forward, we become more like Jesus, more like our Lord. Verse 9, so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread, and Jesus tells them to come and have breakfast. Let me ask you a question at this point. Where did Peter deny Jesus? Do you remember? I just want to show you the Lord's attention to detail. Flip back just a page or two and look at chapter 18, verse 18. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire. For it was cold and they were warming themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. The Greek word that's rendered charcoal fire in both of these verses, it's the only two times that it's used in the entire New Testament. This is not a coincidence. The Lord is setting a scene here. And I'm sure because Peter went and put that robe on before jumping into the water, that by the time he was standing next to Jesus on that beach, he was standing pretty close to that fire because he would have been cold. It's a pretty similar scene to what we saw before, except the Lord right now is standing right next to him. After breakfast, Jesus asked Peter a question, but he begins it by calling him Simon. Simon son of John. If you remember back to the beginning of John's gospel, Jesus has changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter. Peter means rock. His name is a testament to what he would become on the rock of his confession. Remember, he was the first one to recognize that Jesus was the Christ. On the rock of that confession, Jesus said he would build his church. And Peter's also one of the foundation stones of the church that we see in Ephesians uh, 2.20. He was a rock. He became a rock. And everywhere we see Jesus employing that old name, Simon, rather than Peter, he's making a statement. He's saying something. He's communicating something very unique. In the upper room, it was Simon. Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And when he was found sleeping in the garden, when he was told to come and pray, it was Simon. Are you asleep? Could you not watch with me one hour? And now it's Simon. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? 
the only time in the scriptures that Jesus asked that question from anybody. Do you love me? Now, there are several things that Jesus might have meant by that. Maybe he was asking Peter if he loved him more than the fish and the boat and the nets and all of these things that had so defined his life before he met Jesus, all of these other things. Do you love me more than your career? Or maybe he meant, do you love me more than you love your fellow disciples? Do you love me more than you love them, these men who will follow you, whether it's to fish or to go and build my church? Is your love for me greater than your love for them? Or maybe he meant, do you love me more than they love me? Do you love me more than these six others love me? Do you love me more than the four others that didn't come along uh, last night and they're waiting somewhere else in Galilee? Do you love me more than they love me? After all, he'd said that once, even if all fall away, I never will. He said that. That's implying that he loves him more. It's always a question to ask the disobedient believer, do you love the Lord? It's a very searching question. Because our actions ought to reveal our love. Our lives ought to show it. It's a simple question, but it can't be answered with a sentimental response. It demands a decision. I want to say something here that I hope will actually deepen your hatred of sin this morning and your desire to escape temptation such that you make war of it in prayer, such that you wrestle with God to overcome it. Remember, even in Peter's denial, back before it, in the garden, it was Jesus who counseled him to pray. He said, pray, watch and pray. He warned him that the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. So I want to say this. There is a sense. There is a sense in which every time you sin, you are declaring by that sin that you love something more than you love Jesus. You love your reputation more than you love Jesus, so you lie to preserve it, even though the Lord's commanded you not to lie, even though the Lord died for you, your lies. That you love the temporary satisfaction of your lust more than you love Jesus, and so you fix your eyes on that woman, or you fix your eyes on that man, even though you're supposed to turn away because the Lord's told you that it's adultery in your heart if you don't turn away. That you love your money more than you love Jesus because you hold back what you shouldn't. That you love your grudges more than you love Jesus because you won't forgive someone else even though the Lord's forgiven you of so much more. That you love your life more than you love Jesus because you won't lay it down for the one who's laid down his life for yours. I wonder how many chapters of regret might never be written for us as believers if we could just see every temptation that comes our way as being a conscious decision between loving Jesus and loving something more than Jesus. So Peter, he can't point to his most recent track record. He's fallen, he's broken, he's failed, he's done it three times over. He, he can't appeal to the evidence. He can't plead the merits of the crucified life because he hasn't taken up his cross. And so all he has left, all he can depend on, is the understanding heart of Jesus that knows all things including the frailties of our own hearts. Listen to these words from Psalm 103 because they describe that heart of Jesus. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. And he is mindful that we are but dust. And so unable to point to any evidence in his own obedience in this hour of failure and regret, Peter answers and he puts all of his hopes on the all-knowing, all-compassionate heart of Jesus. And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. I wonder if that's some of you 
in this season. You love the Lord, but you found yourself stumbling in sin and succumbing to the world and straying from the Spirit-filled life. In these days that we're in, these days of separation, I want to tell you that the likelihood is far greater that this is going to be the reality for some of us. The church of Jesus Christ was not intended to be socially distant. He didn't design it that way. That's why the writer of Hebrews calls us to encourage one another day after day so that none of us are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that's why we're commanded not to forsake our assembling. And so when we cannot gather as we're accustomed to doing, we still need to make every other effort to gather in the ways that we can. Whether it's over a phone line or it's over a fence or it's over a screen. Because the Christian life is not meant to be a life of isolation. Christ has made his church to be a community. And we need to preserve that. We need to maintain that as best as we can. We need to make efforts. We need to persevere to that end. To remain as the church, as this community, collective, together, bearing one another's burdens, praying for one another, interceding, confessing sin to one another. We need that even in this season, even when everything else around us is being shut down and put on hold. We cannot put the church on hold. And so this is a difficult time for us. And if you're adrift spiritually and you're realizing it in this moment, you're hearing what I'm saying and you're realizing that I'm describing you, then, then I want you to do what Peter was commanded by Jesus to do back in the garden but failed to do. Get on your knees and pray. Seek God's face. Wrestle with him. Cry out to him. Get on your knees. Put your hopes in the all-knowing, all-compassionate heart of Jesus ahead of time so that you don't have to do it later because no one that's ever done that has come back disappointed. Do it now, before the sin worsens, before the sin multiplies. And then call your brother, call your sister, call your pastor, and, and share your struggle so that we can intercede for one another, so that we can pray for one another. And don't be hardened against this warning. If you're hardened against this warning, the only thing you can look forward to is repeating your sin. That's all Peter could look forward to when he didn't pray, when he didn't seek the help of his brothers. Appropriately, I think the Lord's answer to Peter dips into some of the same spiritual waters as Hebrews. Look at this with me in verse 15. He said to him, tend my lambs. Now this is a pastoral command for Peter. This is something that Jesus is commissioning him for. But there's another way of looking at this. If you love me, love the people that I love. If you'll fill your time with care and with fellowship in the communion of the saints, you'll not only have an inoculation against sin, but you'll have it within your hearts the very answer to that question. Do you love the Lord? 1 John 3, 14 tells us plainly, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Tend my lambs. Of course, Peter denied Jesus three times, so the Lord asks him twice more and allows Peter a threefold confession of love to replace the threefold denial. And he's grieved by it in verse 17. It, it's a godly grief, though. It's a grief that renews him. It's a grief that restores him. That is the pain of the dislocated hip being put back into place. But once it's there, he's able to walk again. He's able to walk after Jesus again. And the master willingly, happily accepts him, receives him back. When it comes to those he loves, God will write another chapter. This is that other chapter being written for Peter. He's coming back. He's making his return. As Jesus once said over another broken sinner, he who is forgiven little loves little. And he who is forgiven much loves much. And everyone will see this in the days ahead for Peter. In the book of Acts, it'll be him stepping forward at Pentecost to preach, and 3,000 will be brought into the kingdom. And when he's arrested and beaten, he won't deny Jesus like before. He'll profess Jesus like never before, and he'll even rejoice that he can suffer for him. And when he's released and he's told to stop, he'll stay steadfast and defiant and live the crucified life until he dies, that crucified death and the faithfulness that the Lord describes here. Truly, Truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. 
ancient writers tell us that it was about 34 years after this conversation that Peter was, in fact, crucified. And he actually considered it so glorious a thing to die for Christ that he begged to be crucified with his head facing the ground because he considered himself unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. But it would all begin by simply following. Not perfectly. Not without stumbling ever again, but by following faithfully. In fact, he nearly stumbles with the first new step. Look at verse 20. It's kind of like some of those times before for a minute when he took his eyes off of Jesus and put them on himself, or when he took his eyes off of Jesus and put them on the circumstances that's, that were surrounding him. Now it's the sound of someone walking behind him. Now it's John. Now it's taking his eyes off of the Lord Jesus and putting them on the one that's behind him, looking over his shoulder. And he says, what about him, Lord? What about him? And Jesus stops him immediately. And his answer applies not only to Peter, but to any of us who would worry about what the Lord's plans are for someone else and begin weighing them, comparing them with his plan for us. He says, what is that to you? What is that to you? And then he repeats what he said before Peter got distracted. He says, follow me. You follow me. Remember, the most humbling detail of Peter's former failure came when he compared himself to others. Even if all fall away, I never will. And the Lord's telling him to be done with that. Love them. Tend them. Shepherd them. But don't worry about the plans I have for them and start weighing them against the plans I have for you. Just follow me. That's our second application. To love is to stop comparing the faithfulness Christ calls us to is a forward look to the work Christ has for us. It's not a preoccupation with the work Christ has for others. To love is to stop comparing. Think of it like an orchestra. You think the man in the back with the, the cymbals is too bothered about that violinist near the front? And the trumpeter, he's not worrying himself to make sure that all the strings are coming in on time and the person that's holding the flute they're not eyeing up the trombonist to see what what he's playing that's the conductor's business everyone's off playing their own part he's the one that's putting it together the conductor and that's the way that it's to be in the church that's the way that it's to be in the kingdom we fill the roles that god assigns us with the giftings that he gives to us and he puts it all together and i'll tell you this he does a far better job than our untrained ears could ever realize or could ever hope to do we're not in comparison or competition, and there's no struggle for position because, you see, the glory in all of this is God's. It isn't ours. All of the glory belongs to him. Verse 25, and here's where I want to draw our third and final application from the Gospel of John. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Meanwhile, I stand in this pulpit like a thousand other preachers and I can't even seem to contain the Gospel of John. We spent over a year in this book and we have not exhausted it. There are other sermons that I could have preached but didn't. There are verses we spent a second on that we probably could have spent a Sunday on and this is just one testimony. This is one record, and all of you listening who know the Jesus that John wrote about, you have your own record, you have your own testimony, and if you just begin today writing all the things that Jesus is teaching you, writing all the things that Jesus is doing for you, if you started a journal, you'd run out of pages before you finish. In fact, you would never finish. You would finish before the book would finish. It would be left unfinished. I want you to imagine that that risen Jesus, that God who writes another chapter for us when we need it, that God who has divinely wrought intentions for everyone around us and yet calls us simply to follow him, imagine that that Jesus had a book written about him by you and by everybody else. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he said to them, you are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by all men. And I want to tell you that anyone who believes is a book about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they might not read this one, but 
they're going to read you. And there's an uncountable number of those books when you consider all the lives he's saved. All the sin he's forgiven, all the demons that have been cast out, all the love he's shown us, all the wisdom he's given us, all the truth he's revealed, all the burdens he's carried, all the prayers that have been answered in his name and the healings he's brought us, whether it was the restoration of our bodies or our minds or our spirits or our relationships. Some of you listening have been alive in Christ longer than I've been alive at all, and you know this better than most. The final application of our series is this. There's always something more when it comes to who Jesus is. May God add his blessing to the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 50 glances at this gospel. I, I look back at the last 15 months together and I wonder if I've said enough, if I should have made it a hundred, but I know that if you're willing, we'll return to these pages together someday. And then we'll have many other pages to consider until then, Lord willing, both in your inspired word where it's been written forever and in our lives where the story is still being written. We're so thankful that even when we fail and even when we fall short, you're right there ready to write another chapter for us your grace is greater than our sin. Bless us to see that more. Bless us to know Jesus better. And bless now your church as they add their amens to mine. In his name, amen. Receive this benediction, church, wherever you are. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, may he come quickly.